Hey listeners, Eric Coffey here, the host of GovCon Giants podcast. And today's guest, Matthew Schoonover, was on our show back in our beginnings, right back in 2019, episode number six. He came on talking about joint ventures, mentor protege agreements, and now he's back discussing the new 2021 rules and how that impacts all of us small businesses out there. Stay tuned for this upcoming episode and make sure if you would like to visit and learn more about legal news and updates, his website, govconbrief.com. That's govconbrief.com. Stay tuned for this upcoming episode with the latest and greatest giant, Matthew Schoonover. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to join. I'm, I'm Matthew Schoonover from Schoonover and Moriarty LLC. We are a, a small law firm located just outside of Kansas City that works with small business federal government contractors on all of the fun things that come from working with Uncle Sam. So when we talk about size compliance uh, issues, contract compliance, regulatory compliance issues, uh, joint ventures, mentor proteges, teaming, those type of things that help enhance small business competitiveness when we talk about uh, federal government contracts, as well as on the more litigation side, bid protests, size protest, and performance disputes. So we really try and work with small businesses uh, that work with federal go- the federal government uh, to help their, make their jobs easier. Now, Matt, I may ask you something. How long have you been doing this? Uh, I Well, I've been a lawyer since 2010, and I've been doing this work since, I want to say, about 2015 exclusively. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Um, I know that you also do some blogging about the issues as well. Yep, yep. Uh, our firm runs govconbrief.com. That's a blog okay. where we, we write about a lot of these topics as they relate to small businesses. So we'll write about uh, GAO and SBA OHA decisions. We'll write about regulatory updates as they happen. And we'll also kind of put out some, some tips and, and tricks for working with the federal government. And we really design the blog uh, to be a resource to small businesses in particular. And we want the content to be accessible uh, to small businesses and, and understandable. So we try and uh, provide really just the, the tidbits of information that we think are, are important for small businesses on those particular topics. And if, if you haven't checked out govconbrief.com yet, I'd certainly encourage you to do so. Um, and if you have ideas for any topics that are out there, you know, if, you, if there's something that you're thinking about or that you've seen uh, in regards to a federal government contract and would like us to write about it, drop us a line. We're certainly happy to do, uh, to do that. Now, uh, and thank you for that. Um, on your brief, and we'll, we'll get into some of the issues that you write about, but continuing from our last conversation on joint ventures and mentor protege, I think it's been three years now. It's mm-hmm. like it was 2019. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of things have changed uh, <laughs> I know the mentor protege program has changed. Um, can you tell us about some of the changes that have taken place over the last few years? Absolutely. And, and Eric, when we when we joined um, each other a few years ago, uh, that's when we were talking about the SBA's all small mentor protege program in particular. And that program uh, is is a, a wonderful resource for small businesses. And as its name implies, uh, it really to be eligible for, uh, to participate in the program as a protege, a business just has to be a small business. It can be any of, of SBA socioeconomic designations. It can be an 8A company, it can be a hub zone, an SDBOSB or a woman owned company, or just a plain small business. Um, that program came about in 2016 and was designed very heavily off of the SBA's then existing 8A mentor protege program. So the SBA had a wonderful program for 8A companies under which they could uh, uh, partner with mentors to get business development assistance. Uh, That program was very, very successful to the point that Congress encouraged the SBA to consider mentor protege programs for the other socioeconomic programs as well. And it's out of that encouragement that the all small or the universal mentor protege program was born. But since the programs that is the 8A mentor protege program and the all small mentor protege program were very similar, uh, 
um, it became a matter of time before the all small program essentially subsumed the 8A mentor protege program. And we've seen that happen over the last year. It was late uh, 2020 uh, that uh, uh, the SBA's all small mentor protege program essentially took over the 8A program. 8As are now uh, rolled into the all small mentor protege program. It's still the same program. You essentially get the same uh, business development assistance or opportunities. It's still roughly the same application process. Now it's just instead of having two different programs, one of which is exclusively for 8As, the other one in which 8As can participate, uh, now they just have one program. Now, uh on that program that what's the name of it now it's now the sba's mentor, mentor bunch right program. so they dropped the all small just they, called they mentor the all program. Small. you'll still hear me refer to it as the all small program that's where it came from that's right. what i'm used to saying no that's what i'm used to saying as well that's why i want to ask you to get yeah, it right. I, I still flip into it okay um now for small businesses that are starting out mom and pop solopreneurs what are some of the common questions that you're asked? What are some of the common themes that you see that keep revolving since you've been in this industry for now, um, you know, 11 years? What do you see are some of the common themes that small and mom and pop businesses are, are challenges they're having, areas of, of where they need assistance or technical expertise? From a legal standpoint, what are some of the common themes that you're hearing from small, small businesses? Yeah, and, and that's a wonderful question. And I think, you know, let me say that opportunities exist for small businesses with the federal government. They exist not only in the in the case of prime contract awards. You know, the federal government has a goal every year that at least 23% of its prime contract awards will be made to small businesses. And every year seems to hit at least that top line number. And, and we're talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of goods and services that are being procured directly uh, by the federal government to small businesses. Beyond that, there's subcontracting opportunities there, where even if a small business does not necessarily uh, contract with the federal government as a prime contractor, that small business might be a valued teammate to either a large or a small business prime. Um, and so there's, there's really a lot of, of opportunities out there for small businesses. But one of the main questions that I hear um, or main topics of concern, I should say, is, is how do they break into that marketplace, you know, uh, how, how do they earn their first contract or how do they make their business that kind of compelling uh, case to earn their, their contract award? And I guess I, I don't want to limit that only to brand new businesses because that's really something that I think every business faces when they want to work with the government right. is, is, is how do they make themselves more competitive? Um, and we're seeing more and more of that concern. I think, you know, over the last several years, we've seen opportunities uh, become more and more consolidated, fewer right. contract awards at greater dollar values. Right. Right. And so how do companies compete for, you know, that, that smaller slice of, of perhaps prime, prime contract vehicles? And that's, that's usually where I see things. And so that's where I encourage folks to consider mentor protégés, you know, talk about ways that they might enhance their competitiveness, working with the mentor to develop their business. But beyond that, potential joint ventures or, or teaming relationships, I think are really great ways uh, for businesses to augment some of their, their capabilities and their experiences to work with more experienced contractors uh, to make themselves a, a better candidate for award. Now, I'm surprised that they would, they would reach out to you, uh, a law firm, about how to become more competitive. That's very surprising. Well, and, and let me say that it, that might not be their question. Um, but I think part of what being a lawyer is about, part of what being, you know, a, a, a trusted business partner about is about is listening and helping mm -hmm. to understand what those concepts are. And, and you okay. know, sometimes I hear from folks uh, that 
you know, maybe they've lost out on an opportunity and are trying to understand why um, they've lost out and maybe are exploring the protest options when it comes okay. to that opportunity. Okay. And maybe that's where the conversation kind of comes up. Other times it's just discussing, um, you know, people have heard me speak on the mentor protege or on joint venture programs and they want to learn more uh, about them. And so, um, you know, I think it's taking the time to understand what some of those concerns are uh, and, and hoping to work with your clients to really better position them for success. Okay. No, that's fair. That's fair. What, when um, some of the questions that people have asked me before is why would a large company want to work with me or team with me or joint venture with me? What would be your response to that? Well, you know, I, I think there's really probably two main reasons. The first is altruism. <laughs> you know, maybe the, the large business out there recognizes that this small business has potential. Maybe somebody that's in charge of the large business got their start because somebody helped them. Mm. Uh, you know, so, so maybe there is, is, is a little bit of giving back, uh, you know, okay. good corporate citizenship that's involved. Okay, fair. More often than not, though, and I don't want to minimize that, but really it's <laughs> business. And so it all breaks down to, to money, you know, it, right. it, it, would it be lucrative? Would it be beneficial for that large business to work with a small business? And in some cases, that answer might be yes. So if we have a large business, for example, uh, you know, that large business, just by virtue of its size and status, is unable to bid on and perform small business set aside work. Mm -hmm. And so they're shut out of that marketplace, um, at least as a prime contractor. Maybe they can do some teaming, but, you know, largely they're, they're shut out. And so maybe right. that large business says, I'm willing to mentor a small business company and, and provide them some mentorship, provide them some business development. But then as part of that, we'll work in a joint venture. And now that joint venture will be eligible to bid on that work by virtue of, of our participation in the SBA mentor protege program. And so there's a little bit of, of kind of you scratch my back, I scratch yours. You know, I get access to this market share that I didn't otherwise have access to. Right. And I think largely that is effective for large businesses. If I'm a small business and I'm working with a large business who does nothing about federal contract and I want to use that, that angle, um, you know, a lot of times uh, we've got, we have to convince them of why they should do that, right? Mm -hmm. So what do we, what do we tell the large business that doesn't know about federal contracting? Yeah. And, and that's always a tough question to be right. honest with you. That's, that's a very, that's, that's, that's a tough conversation to have, especially if they don't know right. of federal government contracts. Now I will say if they don't know of federal government contracts and they're a large business, mm -hmm. they're missing out on the opportunity perhaps to be even larger. Um, and, and they're missing out, you know, the, the federal government's the world's single largest purchaser of goods and services. Um, so odds are whatever a large business does, whatever they make, whatever they sell, odds are the federal government is going to buy it in some shape or form. And so they're really missing out on um, opportunities, lucrative opportunities. And, and for small businesses who want to work with mentors, I encourage them to make that as part of their sales pitch, so to speak. Mm. You know, it needs to be a value add. Um, being a mentor, being a productive, being a good mentor takes a lot of time, takes a lot of investment from the mentor company. Right. And I think if a protege just goes into it uh, with the mindset of what can I get from the mentor, they might be met with some resistance to getting that partnership in place. Whereas if they can tell the mentor, here's what I would expect from you, but here's what you might get in return. The opportunity to work on some of these projects, you know, right. you can take up to a 40% equity stake in my company, which means yes, you're spending money up front, but the more successful I am, the more successful you are. So the opportunity to kind of speak in that language, to explain to them what some of the benefits might be, I think is really where small businesses should think about focusing uh, when having that discussion with potential mentors. 
No, they, you brought up something really interesting. They can, you said they can take up to a 40% stake in your company. Yep. Under the mentor protege uh, regulations, a mentor can take up to a 40% equity position in its protege for the purpose of helping the protege raise capital. And so that's very enticing um, because depending on how the parties structure their relationship, you know, in theory, that mentor would get a 40% return uh, on whatever the protege's profits were, you know, if they take a 40% equity right, position, right, 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 right. Of the profit in theory. Uh, but keep in mind too, that, that, that if they form a joint venture, then of the work that the joint venture performs, the mm -hmm. mentor can provide up to, or can, can perform up to 60% of that work and would get profits commensurate with that percentage. So they could be getting up to 60% of the profit from that work of that joint venture. And then, you know, the protege would get the remaining 40% exactly. under that scenario, right. but the mentor would get 40% of that 40%. Right. And so really the SBA has, has built in incentive to get mentors to perform the assistance under these, these programs. And, you know, that's, that's one thing that I caution folks on is if the mentor protege arrangement between a mentor and a protege, a specific mentor and a protege is just a vehicle under which they're going to chase a contract. First of all, the SBA might look at that and say, well, is the protege really going to be getting any benefit under this? Or is it all going to go to the mentor? Is this mentor protege just a vehicle under which the mentor is going to make itself eligible to compete for this work? But beyond that, that's, that's one concern, is maybe the SBA would look at that kind of, you know, just scratch their head a little bit. Mm -hmm. My other you know, concern is, or, or in my experience, when there's a relationship, a mentor-protege relationship that just exists to chase a specific contract. That's sometimes where the relationship goes awry, um, you know, because what happens if they don't reach that, if they don't earn that contract? Is there a commitment to the relationship in either party beyond that? Um, is the relationship really such, you know, that, that they would have gotten into the mentor protege were it not for that contract? Um, so there's considerations that I always, I always tell folks to keep in mind before they enter into these agreements, particularly if it is just something where, where maybe they're going to chase a, a contract. Now, that, that brings me to another question. I was under the impression that in order for them to approve your joint venture, venture protege agreement, you had to have a specific contract that you wrote in there as part of that agreement. Uh, for the joint venture itself, yes. So, right. Uh, yeah. And, and, but, but um, so that's for the joint venture. The mentor protege program is, is different. It's broader than perhaps just the joint. Okay. Venture. Because, because the, the previous, and again, I'm referencing the old 8A1. Mm -hmm. So the old 8A JV mentor protege had to be approved by the SBA. Correct. Right. Okay. Yep. Part of that approval process required approving the actual joint venture to make sure it complied with the rules. Correct. Well, the agreement. Yeah. Yes. So, so the, under the mentor protege relationship, right. Um, the mentor, uh, the protege says, here's the business development assistance I need. And exactly. Says, here's what I'm going to give you. Right. And, and the parties provide benchmarks and timetables and all of that type of stuff. Correct. That business development assistance can include, but doesn't necessarily have to forming a joint venture relationship under which the parties will jointly pursue a specific contract opportunity. Right. So the mentor protege program relates to overall business development. And then the joint venture relates to the specific contract, which could be part of that business development program. Okay. No, I just want to be clear because it's like, you know, I knew that before we had to write in there the specific yeah. project, you know, that we were chasing. And, and for a joint venture agreement, you still do. Okay. You, so, so we, we've seen a shift in the SBA's regulations and, and the SBA updates its joint venture regulations pretty frequently. I don't want to say it's every year, but it's, it's something right. like every 18 or 24 months. Okay. And we just went through another update um, right. on those regulations. And 
as part of them. So you're, you are correct that the, that the old 8A joint venture regulations required the SBA to pre-approve those joint right. venture agreements. SBA no longer has to pre-approve 8A joint venture agreements for 8A competitive awards. It does for sole source, okay. for 8A sole source, but not for 8A competitive. Um, but in those joint venture agreements, regardless of the joint venture, uh, no matter what kind it is, you are going to have to specifically identify a contract that you're bidding on and provide some contract specific information for the joint venture. I always encourage folks, and this is something I cannot repeat enough, is before a joint venture submits its bid, make sure that you have a compliant joint venture agreement for that specific contract opportunity. Um, don't just rely on an old joint venture agreement because again, the regulations do update. And in fact, we just saw an update in November, 2020. And so joint venture agreements that might've worked in say July, 2020 are now out of date. Um, and so you always wanna make sure that you're complying with the latest regulations, because if you're not, or if the joint venture agreement does not, then the joint venture could be found ineligible for the work. That's interesting. That sounds, um, what would have to change about my old agreement? Well, it depends. It depends on, on what type of agreement you had okay. um, and when it was, was, was made. So one of the kind of sneaky changes that we saw in November, 2020 was for small business mentor protege joint ventures. Uh, the joint venture agreement now says that performance of work reports, both, uh, you know, an annual performance of work report that explains how the parties, the joint venture met the performance of work requirement. Mm -hmm. Annual report has to be provided within 45 days at the end of the operating year. The project and performance of work report has to be provided within 90 days at the, uh, within 90 days at the end of the project. That is different than what the other socioeconomic regulations mm. require, which require financial statements, either quarterly financial statements or project and financial statements to be provided within 45 or 90 days respectively. So depending on the type of, of set aside, an old agreement might not be compliant with the new regulations. It's a very kind of sneaky provision that's in there. And one that I hope the SBA soon modifies to make uh, consistent. Uh, consistent, thank right. you, with, with all of the regulations. But until it does, you know, I certainly encourage folks to, to, to review their agreements very, very carefully. That's interesting. What other rules did they change? Well, they, they changed a lot. <laughs> they changed a lot. Um, I know they did. I, I, I had Rob Wong on here not too long ago. So Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. Rob yes. is, Rob's fantastic. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. but, uh, I think uh, Rob stuck all those rules in there. I think. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> well, uh, hey, listen, the good thing is it's, it's helping, uh, right, make the program better, right, yeah. and for more people so it's more accessible. And, and it um, is. And, and so I that's the that's the positive side of things. It is. And 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 you know, I think I think the kind of cynical response is, oh, you know, those lawyers like to keep themselves in business by but changing I, regular. You know, as soon I was thinking I was thinking that, but I didn't say it. You know, uh, I, I get it. I get it. Um, but really the SBA is trying to make its programs more accessible right. and easier, its regulations easier to comply with. And I think right. Case in point is the change for the three and two rule. So the three and two rule is an old rule for joint ventures. that is essentially an affiliation rule that said um, a joint venture cannot win more than three contracts over a two year period measured by the date of the first award, uh, unless it's joint venture members want to be considered generally affiliated with each other. But the way around it is simply to form a new joint venture. So it was this really silly, hard to understand and even harder to apply rule um, that acted as a as kind of a, a catch for the unwary where, where 
the only people it would ensnarl were were folks that you know didn't have a, a living breathing understanding of the regulations to know that this was in there and so it was really yeah. unfortunate and SBA to its credit has recognized that and it's it's modified that rule to make it easier to understand and essentially now what the regulations say is that once a joint venture wins its first contract, it can no longer bid on any new contracts more than two years later. So today, let's just assume today is April 5th, 2021. <laughs> if Eric, if you and I form a joint venture to, and win our first award today, April 25th, 2021, our joint venture can continue bidding on new contracts until April 5th, 2023. We can perform any of those contracts that we bid on, even if that bid or that award comes after April 5th, 2023. Right. Our joint venture just can't bid on new contracts after April 5th, 2023. Right, right. right. And if it does, we'll be considered generally affiliated with each right. other. Now, right. the way around it is still for us to form a new joint venture that will then bid on new work. But at least this rule is easier to understand. It's right. easier for folks to say, Okay. I know I've got a two-year cutoff right. here after right. which I can no longer bid on new work. No, it gives me a definitive hard stop date. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> that I can measure by. I'm like, okay, yeah. let me go back. And, okay. Yeah. Well, um, and you're, you're not trying to count when was I awarded this contract? When did I bid on it? All right. of that type of stuff, you know, that was, that was very hard to, to apply. And so now you can say, okay, I, I have my cutoff here. It's an objective cutoff. Um, and, and it's easy for me to understand when I have to stop bidding that work. When someone is considering working with a large business that understands federal contracting, um, what types of things should I be cautious about um, before deciding upon pursuing a relationship of a joint venture and or mentor protege? What are some of my red flags? What are some of the warnings that I should that's a, that's a That's a wonderful question. And let me say that, that there are, by and large, a lot of the, the large businesses out there are great partners to work with. Um, you know, particularly if they've, they've, if they've grown through their size standard, a lot of them right. understand and get it. But I will say that keep in mind that the, the large business contracting world is different than the small business contracting. <laughs> There's a whole new set of regulations and requirements when we talk about small business federal contracting. So I encourage folks, don't be reliant on your partner to know what the ins and outs are. Don't mm. be reliant on them to tell you what you can and can't or shouldn't do under the regulations because they might not know about them. Okay, the large funny. businesses don't, don't generally do a lot with the SBA's regulations. Mm. And that doesn't make them a bad partner. That doesn't make them a ne'er-do-well or anybody that's trying to defraud the government or anything like that. It just means that you need to have a better understanding. And in some cases, you know, we've done this on behalf of our small business clients before, where we've had to help educate large businesses to say, if you want to compete in the small business contracting realm, here are the regulations you have to keep in mind. And, and almost uniformly, in the vast majority of instances, when once you have that understanding, once the large has that understanding, then they know, okay, I've, I've got this out there. Here's what I've got to do. Here's what I have, uh, you know, can't do. Here's what I should do, all of that type of stuff. Um, but sometimes getting them to that point, providing them that education can be a little tricky. Um, and so I encourage folks, don't just rely on your large business uh, uh, teammate, your large business mentor, your large business joint venture partner, whatever the case may be, to know those regulations for you. Sure. Um, to, would you encourage someone to uh, team with the large business first before doing a joint venture or mentor protege? I think, I, yes, I would. And I think that's, that's an absolutely great way to get to know your potential partner. Right. Right. You know, it's, it's right. a relationship and, right. and you don't want to walk into it 
without without a good working understanding of that company, how it does business, you know, and and who you're going to be working with, particularly on the mentor protege side, um, you know, I think teaming relationships are a wonderful way to get to know potential partners um, and to say maybe I don't want to work with them. You know, this was a great opportunity, but when we were actually on the ground working, we didn't get along that well, or I didn't like the way they did things, or they didn't like the way I did things, or, you know, what have you, or they were a great partner. You know, it's somebody that I would recommend any small business work with. Knowing that, I think, is invaluable. I mean, that's the type of, of competitive intelligence or business intelligence, that firsthand information that is just invaluable. Is there a place that we can go to find out if the large business say um, did something wrong to the small business or did something wrong at all? Um, it, well, and you know, how do we do our own like due diligence, maybe some homework? Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of a, I know SBA publishes a suspension and debarment list. Okay. But it, it would be That's, pretty outrageous yeah. for somebody. Right. <laughs> Um, I think what you're talking about is more, is somebody a good partner to work with? Right. I think it's appropriate to ask for references okay. to say, you know, do you have a small business that you have worked with um, in the past that we can, we can talk to? Um, and they might say, yeah, here you go. You know, you can work with, uh, you know, XYZ Corp. We, we right. do a lot of work with them. Um, or... It, I tend to think that when small businesses are, are, are doing that due diligence, they know their industry. Um, they know people that work in the industry. Maybe they've worked at that old company or they know somebody who mm -hmm. does and they can ask those folks. I mean, it's people are always going to have NDAs and all of that type of stuff that might limit what they can say in certain circumstances. Sure. But I don't think it hurts to ask, you know, check LinkedIn. Um, that's a wonderful place to see, do I have a connection that works here that used to work here um, that, that maybe I can run some of these questions to ground with. Ask the agency um, if they have worked for folks. You know, unfortunately, past performance information is source selection material. So it's not like a contractor can go into cars and say, I want to find something for, you know, Lockheed Martin um, to see if they're a good contractor. Uh, but you know, maybe they have a sense of, hey, is is there something I should be aware of here? Um, but knowing those relationships, I think, I think is is very beneficial to small businesses. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. The there's been some other rule changes that's happened at the government level. Um, I know one is the Buy American Act, but then the other one is. Um, the rules affecting LPTA. Yep. LPTA is has been uh, that's so lowest price technically acceptable. That is the acquisition strategy in which the federal government says the bare minimum technical acceptability I'll buy so long as it's the cheapest option. You know, it's it's primarily concerned about price. That contrasts with best value, where the government's saying, I'm willing to spend a little bit more money in some cases, if it gets me a better product or a better service, if it's worth it to me um, after a trade-off of, of the benefits there. Um, LPTA has kind of fallen out of favor with the federal government. And it, you know we've seen it happen over the course of the last few years with several NDAAs in a row where Congress was limiting, particularly the, the Department of Defense's ability to buy things on an LPTA basis unless certain crit, uh, criteria were met. Recently, we saw an update to uh, the FAR. I think it's it's off the top of my head, it's either FAR 15.101-2 uh, uh, or 15.102-1, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, but the FAR, has now limited the use of LPTA procurements in most circumstances. In order to use LPTA going forward, the government has to essentially be convinced that, you know, 
better technical specs won't matter. Um, and that price is really the determining factor here, you know, that spending more money won't get it necessarily a better product. And it has to document that decision. And, and we've, I think that's important because it, when the FAR was updated, it applied not only to DOD, but to civilian agencies as well. And so we're seeing this pushback against uh, LPTA on a government-wide basis, which is very, very interesting. And I think has the potential to be really beneficial to small businesses. You know, a lot of times small businesses have less flexibility when it comes to their pricing, but where they really excel is offering better products or better services, more innovative solutions. And so to the extent the government is, is pushing things towards that best value acquisition model, then I think small businesses might really benefit from that. And so I encourage folks, if they have an acquisition out there that they're chasing and they see that it's been set aside on an LPTA basis, mm -hmm. and they think, hmm, I could probably compete better if this was under best value or if price was, was less of a consideration, uh, then to consider your options, you know, reach out to the contracting officer to, to ask if it should be best value or, or you know, even consider a pre-bid protest uh, where mm. you're challenging that term and saying, this should be best value. Um, and so I think that one, that change really has the potential uh, to maybe benefit small businesses. We'll see, it's a relatively new change. I think it came about mid-February, 2021, end of February, 2021. Um, and so we'll see how this kind of impacts uh, uh, small business contracting going forward. Well, I can tell you, I was in a clubhouse room with a contracting officer who said she's still using LPTA. <laughs> I think, you know, it makes it simpler for them in a lot of ways. Right, right. When they're doing it, you know, they, 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 they line up the orders or, or the, the, the bids and they say, who's the lowest price? They take that one and they say, is this technically acceptable? If it is, great, that's the award. If it's not, then they go to the next lowest price and see if that one's technically acceptable and so on until they find it. And, and so I think it does make it easier for agencies. And after all, they save money in, in theory. Um, but I'm not sure it makes sense really for, for businesses. Um, and, and for you and I, when we purchase something, right, you know, right. it's always that thought that we have of, of, you know, is this something that I should spend a little more money on? Right. Oh, um, if definitely. I get, if I get something that's better. Right. Now, under a best value, the government still can say, listen, you know, we're going to go with the less expensive one here. Right. You know, the price premium isn't worth it to us. Right. They have that discretion, um, but it does grant them discretion. And so that's why I think it's important. You know, something that um, happened to me recently on a project that was an 8A sole source, they question our uh, local geographic area, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, this is just started happening recently. Uh, I've seen it in the past a long time ago, but it came up in question on a project that the government was trying to award me. CFR 124.5014 now requires 8A eligible firms to have a bona fide office place. On a recent project, we were challenged with not being a localized 8A firm uh, and not having a bona fide office in the place, but it was only because the contracting specialist or contracting, it wasn't the contracting officer, it was the contract specialist uh, that came down from legal. She turned to the contracting officer, they overruled because it said we were within a geographical area. So we weren't in the same state, but we we're in a geographical, uh, what they call metropolitan statistical area. Have you seen that? Well, we're seeing more and more of it. You know, I've, I've okay. heard more from contractors, particularly on the construction side. Yes. That this that that this is a concern, and in the 8A program, they do require um, 8A companies to have a, a bona fide place of business within that geographic scope. Now, I think they did not require that before. Well, and and but we're seeing more and more from uh, contractors saying this is something that I'm hearing, um, and in fact, you know, I've heard of some 
uh, BOS is taking it, 8A business opportunity specialist is taking it, you know, really to an extreme. And okay. so we'll see, I think, as this again, because they did just update the regulations, I believe, with regard to this uh, specific requirement or, or clarified them. Uh, we'll see how this kind of continues to play out. But certainly with regard when it comes to, to 8As, you know, there, there have been a lot, a lot of changes to the program um, over the last year. Now, some of them have certainly made it easier for 8A companies. You know, when we talk about increased economic disadvantage thresholds, uh, when we talk about the potential for another year of eligibility, depending right. on when the company was, was in the program based on, on COVID, uh, when we talk about changes to the application process, I think overall, again, the, the, the regulation updates that we've seen from the SBA are by and large things that help 8A companies either stay eligible um, or, or maintain their, their eligibility. Right, right, right. Okay, now it was something that came up on a uh, recent project that it's actually still in the, it's still up in legal. We're mm -hmm. waiting for the final contract to come down. But when I spoke to the contract officer representative and asked what was going on, that was the issue that popped up. That gotcha. arose, was that um, the whole bona fide office. Yeah. So it's interesting because one of our um, complaints, I would say, to the government was that they were awarding so many 8A contracts to outside companies outside of the state. Mm -hmm. That was actually an issue that we had because um, you know, a lot of companies were coming from DC and then some of them from, from as far as Washington all the way to the East Coast and taking, you know, the bulk of the work. Yeah. Um, and so that was actually an issue. And then to see that regulation come out, I go, wow, this is interesting. Um, it, almost, it almost used against you in this. Right. Oh, exactly. It's almost now used against me. <laughs> <laughs> right. In this particular scenario. Um, and, and again, this is a project that we we put together numbers over a year ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Well, they had to wait a, for the funding. Mm -hmm. And then now this whole new regulation came up. So it's yeah. probably 16, 18 months. Well, and, and, and I think this goes back to your, your question earlier of, of what is some advice for small businesses that are, are looking to break in. And I think the number one there is patience, patience. you know, because you can submit a bid on this right. one. And it is not uncommon for a year plus to go by. Right. right. Frustratingly enough, most likely in silence, you know, before you hear anything about the award and, and the process from the government side is <laughs> nothing's fast, of course. Um, and there's a lot of different layers that it that ultimately it has to go through. And really, you know, the the more complex the acquisition, the larger the acquisition, it only increases that. So certainly, it's one of those hurry up and wait type things where you know you're you beat rushing me to it. You you're rushing to, to get it. the bid in. You're working like crazy, and then all of a sudden it just goes silent for forever. And then one day you'll hear and hopefully it's, be off to performance from there. So it's always hurry up and wait. Yep. Yep. So tell, tell us about the new Buy American Act. What's going on with that? Well, we're seeing more and more, you know, obviously each administration when they come into office, you know, every administration, no matter the party wants to increase uh, American manufacturing and, and American capabilities and uh, reliance on American um, made goods. And, and we're certainly seeing that, you know, with, President Biden. And we've seen the Buy American Act be updated recently to include, um, or excuse me, to, to modify uh, the domestic content um, percentages. I don't have them off the top of my head, but you know, really one of the things that, that President Biden, I think is, is looking to do is increase, how do I want to frame it, um, to, to increase the teeth or, or, or sharpen the teeth behind the Buy American Act, so to speak, 
um, so that American manufacturers have a leg up, really, particularly when it comes to, to federal government contracts. You know, we're seeing, um, uh, I think he, he wants to rely less on waivers of the Buy American Act under federal contracts, and in fact, uh, has issued an executive order that creates a new made in America office within the Office of Management and Budget to mm -hmm. oversee that waiver process and hopefully reduce them uh, or the, the reliance on them when it comes to federal government contracts. So over time, I think we'll see um, an increase um, in domestically sourced items under federal contracting. That's when, it, when you talk about the waiver process, um, is are you, do you, is that something that you commonly work with, or no? Yeah, it, 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 you know, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't come up at least in our practice okay. a great deal. Um, it does come up on occasion, but I won't, uh, you know, I won't profess to be an expert right. on, no, that's just, off right. the top of my head. Um, it's always something that whenever it does come up, I'm usually pulling up the statute and the regs to, to make sure I've got it in front of me. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, we do see it on occasion. And the reason why I ask is in construction, a lot of our products, right, particularly like screws, fasteners, mm -hmm. there are no American made products. Mm -hmm. Okay. Even if you buy them from an American made company, that doesn't that was not their they're, place of origin. They're getting <laughs> right. They're getting it someplace else. And so we we're faced with that quite often. And I just, you know, uh, we talked about waivers. C can you explain to the people listening what is a waiver? Because um, I used to believe that when it says buy American, that meant it has to be American made. Yeah. And Usually that is correct. Now, in some right. cases, they can waive, the government can waive that requirement for uh, the Buy American Act, um, usually because there is a specific item that they believe um, is not domestically sourced. Right. Um, that's really going to depend. I always tell folks, you know, read your contract very, right. very carefully. Obviously, right. you're going to know more about what those requirements are after reading the contract. And each contract is different. Um, and so you want to read it very, very carefully. You want to read the solicitation very, very carefully because this should be in the bid. And so you should know before you actually bid on the, on the work uh, what it is. But yeah, in, in some cases, you know, they can, they can certainly waive those requirements. In my contract, it'll have Buy American Act A through G, let's say. And if, if your item, um, if, it's, if you can comply with list out A through G, that you are potentially eligible for a waiver, but hmm. then it has to still be approved by the contracting officer. Yeah, yeah. So work with your contracting. You know, you really want to you want to work with them and make sure that they're understanding kind of the difficulties, obviously that 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 uh, you might you might face, and we'll see how that process changes going forward. Obviously, based yeah. on on the new executive order and the um, uh, implementation of uh, the new Made in America office how that's gonna change the waiver process going forward. It'll be very, very interesting to see. One other thing that'll be interesting to see, you know, as we talk about this, particularly in the construction realm, mm -hmm. is that, uh, you know, as, as, as we sit here today, um, Congress, I believe, is, is currently debating a, a massive infrastructure deal. Um, and we'll see what that means for small businesses, but hopefully, you know, it's a good thing. You know, if, if the federal government is talking about spending two trillion dollars approximately right. on on infrastructure projects, um, you know, hopefully that means more work, obviously, for small businesses, either on a prime side or through subcontractors. And a lot of this work very well might come through the ADA program. Right, 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 right. What other questions have you received recently? regards to social economic set asides? Well, you know, we're seeing still some questions, obviously, when it comes to affiliation and size issues, how it impacts small businesses. You know, the, the, the threshold question, or when we say small business, obviously, it's, it, it means something right. to the SBA. And so I tell folks, you want to know, is your business actually small? Um, and SBA determines that uh, 
based on various calculations. It's not just a hunch, but it's something that you need to know and you need to understand when you're bidding on this work. And you need to not only understand it so you know if you're eligible for a specific contract or for a specific socioeconomic opportunity, but I've had some clients say, listen, I've grown a lot. I'm doing really well. I've got to take my foot off the gas a little bit because I need to stay small. And if I keep up this pace, I've got very limited time left. So I'd rather you know, ease up just a little bit now mm. and hopefully get myself a little more time as a small business versus keep going breakneck, breakneck, breakneck. And that's something that I think it's appropriate for businesses to know so that they can make those informed decisions uh, about their best paths forward. And so, uh, you know, certainly you want to know, am I small? How much longer am I going to be small? That type of stuff. I think a lot of us want to know who's that guy or girl. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Out there holding up on the gas pedals. Like, hold on, wait, I, I mean, slow I, down. I've had a couple of folks say, I've, I've got to pass on this opportunity. You know, it'd be a great opportunity for them, but there's risk if they win it. Right. Where they say, well, based on the size of this contract, you know, if I win it, yeah, it's a great contract for me, but long term, it's not what I need. Yeah, so, uh, I um, I was recommended a book. I can't think of the name, um, and it was a story like that where the, the, the company went from small to large, and then they lost the recompete. So now they were large, even though they didn't have the sales, but then they could commit. They could not compete with small business contracts. Yeah. So it's kind of a conundrum. Well, it is. And then not only that, not only can they not compete for small business contracts, but then all their competitors, they're out there competing against the largest businesses that do what they right. do. Right. And so, yeah, you're, you're kind of stuck in this position of, I'm not small, but I'm certainly not large. Right. What do I do? And, and, you know, quite frankly, we've seen Congress think about this more and more. And we've seen the SBA think about this more and more over the last few years when we talk about these mid-market um, right. businesses. Um, or middle-sized businesses. And that's really one of the reasons why in 2018, Congress passed the Small Business Runway Extension Act, right. which right. gave businesses additional runway time to be considered small Correct. under, under receipts-based NAICS codes and why we're seeing the same thing happen for employee-based size standards here. And so we'll see, you know, Obviously, hopefully this helps, but there, there's also the subset of businesses out there where these changes might hurt, you know, if they're, if they're in the other side. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so right. knowing where you are in that, I mean, I tend to think that that's, you, you can't strategically plan your business without knowing all of the facts. And, and, you know, too often in my mind, businesses don't think about their size or don't think about affiliation issues until there's a problem, until they go to win a contract and somebody protests them, or until they, they go for a socioeconomic designation and realize maybe we're not small. Um, and so knowing what those requirements are and knowing, okay, maybe I do need to make some changes here, um, I think really helps business owners more strategically plan. You know, it's interesting. Uh, um, you know, I had that issue with affiliation mm -hmm. and you know, it, for me in construction, it's really tough because if you've been around for some time in construction industry, you've learned who are the good contractors and who are the bad contractors. Yep. So you tend to only work with the good ones. Yeah. So it, it gives the appearance of affiliation, but really is it's just a wise business move because these other guys, they string you along for money. They give, you know, they don't allow you to, to pass your inspections. They find reasons to hold back your draws. And so you really, it's hard for you to do business with them. And over time you've learned, okay, I just want to work with these one or two companies yeah. because I never have any problems. You know, they work with me. They don't, um, they don't come in. And if I'm doing floors, you know, they're not going to come in and tell me to put the floors in and then paint the walls afterwards. Silly yeah. things like that. Right. And then hold me accountable because you know, they're behind schedule and they did things out of order. So I know that personally, I had that issue with the SBA on the affiliation just because of that. And, um, you know, it was a hard thing to argue. Mm -hmm. I, I thought I was being um, 
you know, a prudent business person. And they thought I was, you know, working for the man or whatever the case yeah. may be. <laughs> well, and you're right. And that's why when I, when I talk about affiliation, I say affiliation is really an insidious concept for mm. small businesses because right. you can have an affiliate and not even know it. Right. I mean, in your case, you're saying, I'm just doing what a, a smart business person does. I've got a great partner here or a few great partners. We treat each other well. I know how they work. They know how I work. Absolutely. But you're right that in some instances, the SBA might look at that and say, that could be indicative of affiliation. And so there, in some cases, this conflict um, between sound or prudent business practices and what the SBA says you, you can and can't do. And everything's always a question of degree, you know, under, under the regulations. Right. Um, but again, for small businesses, knowing what those risks are, um, I think is, is vital um, to understanding, is there something here that I've got to guard against? Because I don't want, you know, the SBA to look at my size and have any questions. If, if I'm ever called to account, I want to say, here you go. I don't have any affiliates. I know these answers, or I have a risk of affiliation, but for these reasons, it doesn't apply, or I'm still a small business or what have you. Um, yeah, uh, it can be a very, very difficult topic for small businesses. I'm going to flip the subject here. You've uh, recently, you found your own firm with your partner. How's that experience been? It's been great. I mean, it is, it is exceeded my wildest expectations. I, I, I am very, very blessed in, in a lot of ways. Um, but certainly I have a great team with me, my partner, Matt Moriarty, and I, uh, you know, I think get along well and, and complement each other uh, very well. Um, it, we're joined by Ian Patterson and John Maddox, who are just great attorneys. Um, Julia Peterson uh, helps run the show behind the scenes. And, and overall, we are a wonderful, wonderful team. And I'm every day more and more grateful for them and amazed at the work that they do because I couldn't do what I do without them. Mm. And for me, you know, that's, I think before when I was working with small businesses and small business owners, uh, you know, I think in some ways there was always that disconnect where I didn't necessarily understand everything that they've been going through. And now as a small business owner myself, I think I can, you know, I'm, I've not stood in their shoes, but we've been in the same general vicinity, right. Right. <laughs> you know? Um, where we all have, no matter what industry we're in, we all have stuff that keeps us up at night. We all have goals that we're trying to meet. And I tell you what, I think I listen better now mm. that, that I've got this business, uh, than I did, I did before. And so it has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Like I said, I, I can't speak highly enough about my colleagues because they really do, um, make it possible. Oh, that's, I, I, I actually, I had Emily Harmon on recently, and she said the same thing, transitioning from working, well, again, she worked for government, mm -hmm. to now coming out and being a small business owner, uh, lots of lessons learned, <laughs> like she said, she says, I would give, you know, the advice, but from a, you know, the standpoint of a government employee, not from an actual sure. small business owner. Standpoint. Exactly right. And so it makes a huge difference now that she's on the other side. Yep. And now you're, I think you're a little more attuned to the goals and the concerns maybe that another small business owner has. And, right. and you know, it's, it, nobody has it easy, no matter what they do, no matter what industry they're in. Um, nobody has it easy. And I think understanding that um, is, is, is very beneficial, um, you know, no matter what industry you're in. Fair. I think we, on the episode that we lost... <laughs> I don't know if I got around to asking you the Amazon question. What was your most recent purchase on Amazon that you enjoy? Well, I, I, you did ask me, and my answer then, I, uh -huh. I'll say, was was much better than it is now. Oh, I already answered all right. now. My give, answer, give, all right, give me the answer of the episode we lost. Okay, well, <laughs> well let me tell you my answer. My answer now is grass seed. I recently bought grass seed okay. on, on Amazon because I didn't want to go to the hardware store. 
grassy like, from Amazon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My, my, my answer that I had then, you know, it's all going to turn brown anyway, right? So where's the matter where I buy it? Uh, In your area, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> my answer that I had then I thought was much better because we had, I, I can't remember if we originally recorded right before or right after Christmas. I, I, I don't remember. But I, I think know. it was right at because we bought for my wait. No, yes. no, no. You bought a gift for a yes. child. For, yes. for, for my daughter. Yes. Uh, you bought a gift for your daughter. A, okay. A trampoline that goes in our basement. Yes. There you go. And my wife and I literally just assembled it the night before we spoke. And right. you know, in the instructions, you know, you unrolled the scroll of instructions and it looked like it was printed in a different language. And one of the first lines said, like, this will not be fun for you. Mm -hmm. um, and my wife and I did it, you know, together. Right. In I remember under, that. In like an hour. Right. We kind of had fun doing it. Right. And then we got to see my daughter's reaction to this trampoline. Right. right. And, and, you know, my kids are at home for school and, and just cooped up. And so it was a gift for my daughter, but more than that, it was a gift for my wife. So hopefully my daughter can burn off a little energy, you know? Um, but that was a much, much better answer and a much better purchase, I will say, than my most recent purchase. Well, the grass seeds obviously serve some benefit. Yeah, hopefully, you know, when that starts growing, then she'll get out there and, and run around. Run around. Bit, but yeah. How many kids do you have? I have two. So I have a, a son who is seven and my daughter is four. All right. Thank you. That, that humanizes you. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, yeah, we need some of that. You know, after yeah. an hour speaking legal speak, people want to know you're a real person. Hey, I, I'm always happy to talk about my kids. You know, they are... They, I, I'm, I miss them every day that I'm here. You know, my daughter actually just came to work with me on Friday. Oh, that's here. fun. Well, they were they were nice enough to put up with it and act like it wasn't a major distraction. But, you know. Uh, I, I, I I want to see what happens when they're like 11 and it's like, you know, bring your kids to work day. Yeah. <laughs> I know what my son said. He'd rather go to school. <laughs> yeah. Because I was in construction and I said, you go to work with me, you're definitely and have a shovel in your hand. Yeah, you're, you're swinging you're, a hammer. You're swinging a hammer. Yeah. He's like, no, I, can I say a school teacher? <laughs> when he was little, yeah, it was all, it's fun. But when, he, when they become preteens and teenagers, they say, no, nah, I'll just stay in school. It's yeah. fine. We'll play on the computer all day anyways because all the other kids will be gone. Yeah. So Well, so. you know, it's it, but that's it, it makes it all worth it, right? Because it then does. you can go home and, and, and see them and talk about their day. I mean, all of the fun stuff that it's, it's just great. No, no, let me tell you, I was, uh, it's funny. I was telling someone, my nephew had his six-year-old birthday party Saturday. Okay. Um, and a friend of mine invited me to, um, this private event with like one of the founders of Facebook. And I said, no, I'm going to go to the six-year-old birthday party. Yeah. <laughs> and he says, really? I said, yeah. I said, because when I'm 66, he's going to remind me, he says, uncle, remember when you went to that private event and you missed yeah. my birthday? He says, good point. Tell him I said hi. I said, yeah, exactly. Plus, it's <laughs> probably better cake at the birthday party too. Right? Better, yeah, better everything, I'm sure, at the birthday party. Go. Yeah, yeah. Good. I mean, everyone there was happy to see me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. You know, so I didn't feel out of place at all, you know. Yeah. Water slides, water guns. That sounds pretty fun to me. That sounds pretty fun to me too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I'm good. Um, listen, before we wrap up, tell us an odd place or odd job that you've had in the past. Uh, well, my one of my very first jobs, I worked at a laser tag place. Get so out of here. Laser tag arena. Um, and I would work Friday nights and the place would be open until one o'clock in the morning. And we had laser tag regulars that would come in and hang out with us and all of that. So it was actually, it was actually kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I like that. I, I, I couldn't like play it now. I'd, I'd be terrible at it now. I was terrible at it then. Um, but I tell you what, it, it, it's still pretty fun. No, I, I played laser tag once or twice. It was hard for me. Yeah. It was hard. Yeah. I think paintball was easier than laser tag. Oh, really? I felt, yeah, I felt that way. Cause I played, you played paintball in the day and you played laser tag in the dark. <laughs> That's true. For me, it's just, I don't know, maybe my That's senses true. were just, they didn't, it didn't work well with that. 
That is very true. Darkness. It's it's dark. There's like neon paint and right and loud music. At least there was at the place I worked, and yeah, it's very disorienting. You're exactly right. That's for me at least. And I'm in the daytime. I'm hiding behind like wheelbarrows and tires and trees, stuff that I did anyways growing up. So that's yeah, very just, normal environment for me. Yeah. Even Hang climbing in those big tree. tubes. Yeah. yeah. So, Maybe like, have a I mean, I, shot, we had, I mean, I had BB gums growing up and slingshots. So that we did that anyway. So that was very normal. Just being in a dark place with neon lights, it's like messing with my recta. recta. <laughs> it's like, I, I, get, I get you. Yeah. Yeah. No, you I know. see it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, maybe we should all get together and, and do some paintball then. How about that? That's what I think we should do. Paintball. GovCon paintball. That would be fun. I, I I think that would be great. I, you heard it here first, everybody. GovCon, GovCon paintball. paintball. I think it's better than a convention. <laughs> That's true. That's it's, true. Maybe this could be the convention. I, I Yeah. Networking. And also, you know what? Maybe. Okay, how about this? How about this? Maybe instead of having a golf island, or in addition to the golf, we could have paintball. There you so go. for those who don't want to go play golf, we go play the paintball. Tell like Michelle that. from from Hub. Okay, I'll <laughs> I'm sure Mich Michelle's pretty open minded. Yeah, she'd probably go for it. She'd be really good at paintball too. I think. I think she probably is. Yeah, good at paintball. All right, give us some parting words let, so we can let you go today, sir. Tell well, thank you so much. It's it's a pleasure to join you again, and and we got to do it more often. You know, again, I'm Matthew Schoonover from Schoonover and Moriarty. It's been an absolute pleasure to to join you and to talk about some of these issues. And I certainly hope that everybody has a wonderful 2021, much better than 2020, and that we're all back together again very very soon. Yeah, and and I hope that we were able to show you guys that at the you know look, this is a serious subject matter. Um, and again, we all have small businesses. We all have challenges. We're, we're risking our money. We're hiring people and we've got a lot on the line, but at the same time, you know, we can laugh and joke and have a good time. So I hope yeah. at the very least, you know, people are able to see that those of you who stayed all the way to the end, at the very <laughs> least, you can see that. So maybe I'll have Maria move this up to the front, but there we go. <laughs> so give us, uh, give us your website and give us the govconbrief.com site as well. So we've got govconbrief.com, all one word. We have schoonoverlawfirm.com, all one word. That's S-C-H-O-O-N-O-V-E-R, lawfirm.com. And my phone number is 913-354-2630. If you have any questions, give me a call. I'm always happy to chat. And, and no, Matt's a really great guy. We've actually worked with him here, uh, GovCon Giants, and we've referred people to him as well. So I can definitely vouch for that. He's for which a I pleasure to work with. Very he's a pleasure to work with, easy to work with, um, and he's not going to steal out of both pockets. <laughs> hey, listen, Matt, thank you so much. Thank it's you, sir. Take care. Take care.